you want to open your Bibles, we are going to continue on in the book of Jude, but we're actually going to be starting today in John chapter 15. So those are the two places we'll be, uh, so you're prepared in advance that we're going to be in John 15 first, and then we will move on to Jude. I have a confession to make to you this morning. I wrote this entire sermon while listening to Christmas music in my office. Before Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's me. I'm that guy. Instrumental Christmas music will be played in my office probably almost every day for the next few weeks. But that's just who you guys have. So for a couple, uh, okay, so four times since I've been at this church, I've been able to go on this youth trip called Wilderness. And wilderness has been one of my favorite things that I have ever been able to do. I have been to other youth conferences before, and nothing quite compares to the wilderness youth conference that is put on by CIY. It is fabulous. The first time I went was the fall of 2016. I remember it was the fall of 2016 because where we were in the mountains, you could not watch the playoffs for the Major League Baseball playoffs that were going on, and the Cubs were looking like they were going to do something, and we all know it was the greatest World Series of history in 2016, and, but I was not able to watch the first couple rounds because I was in the mountains in Colorado, and it was awesome. Uh, while I was there, my back flared up, and it was kind of crazy. I couldn't hardly sleep. I couldn't hardly sit. But I was able to hike. I don't know what the deal was. I could walk and hike with no problem, but when I went to sit down or lay down, my back was a mess. And so that was kind of crazy. But I was so thankful I I was able to go, and it was such an amazing experience. Now, the structure of wilderness is what makes it different from other youth conferences. I've been to the National Youth Workers Conferences. I've been to youth ministry seminars and stuff like that. And what they do at those is they, they bring us together for big room experiences where we worship together and somebody will speak, and then the rest of the day is filled with workshops, and there's tons of different workshops you can choose from. And what I've found to be true about them is there's some good information, but it tends to be a, hey, here's how you do youth ministry with the budget of a big church. Well, (laughs) that doesn't work at a a smaller church that doesn't have a $40,000 youth ministry budget, you know? And so it just kind of got annoying to go to those. And when I went to wilderness, the structure was so different because the purpose of wilderness isn't about the latest fads and the latest things to do in youth ministry. It's about who you are as a minister, as a man, and it's, it's really an incredible experience. And so you, you fly out to uh, Denver, Colorado. Most of us fly into Denver because it's cheaper to fly into Denver. Rent a car and go into Colorado Springs, and then from Colorado Springs you go up into the mountains. And base camp is Bear Trap Ranch, which is about 9,100 feet up above sea level. So if you've ever been uh, in higher elevation, you know what that does to you. And it's pretty incredible. And so just hauling my bag from the parking lot to my cabin, I was winded. It It was pretty incredible. And it was awesome, though, because I walked in, I set up my, I got into my room, and I put my stuff down, and, and I greeted the guy who was there to greet me, and he said, here's your bag, see you at supper. And he handed me a brown paper bag, and I was just free to go into the wilderness, into the, into the mountains, and there were lots of trails that you could follow. And so I grabbed my, my book bag and my water, and I started hiking up this mountain, and it was pretty incredible. Uh, how fast you wear out. Uh, Just multiple stops, just trying to get up to this. And I went for that first hike all by myself. Didn't really know where I was going, but figured it out. And I landed on the top of Sugarloaf Mountain, and here's the view that you get from the top of Sugarloaf Mountain. And I can tell you that that picture does not do it justice. It is absolutely gorgeous, and I'm sitting up there on this rock just probably for about 20 minutes just, just looking because it was so beautiful. And I, I sat down, and I opened my Bible, and I opened up my brown paper bag, and inside of that brown paper bag was about three things. There was a journal, there was communion, and there was a devotional to go through. And I started going through that devotional and taking communion, and I was journaling, and I was just worshiping on the top of this mountain. And it was such an incredible experience because the purpose of wilderness is to make sure that 
as a minister, I'm right with God. As a husband, I'm right with God. As a father, I'm right with God. And I love that aspect of the wilderness experience. And uh, so I'm so thankful that you guys have sent me four times. It, it has been a blessing to my life. So the, the theme of that first wilderness was abide. And it was honestly a little difficult for me. I didn't quite understand what was going on. I didn't understand this word abide. It was, it was a struggle for me, and it was all based out of John 15, and it seemed too simple to me. It seemed like, that's too easy. That's not how I need to do it. That's too easy. And it took me a long time, in fact, a long time after my experience at Wilderness for me to understand why I was struggling so much with that word. And the struggle that I had was that I couldn't accept grace. I was convinced that I needed to make up for my sinfulness. As a minister, as a, as a father, as someone who's trying to stand up in front of people and teach them truth, I felt like I had to be perfect. I had to be perfectly obedient. And I, I wasn't giving myself any grace. I was so ready to give grace to everyone else, but I couldn't offer myself that same grace. I had to make up for it. And I kind of was walking around trying to prove myself worthy to God. But to abide meant that I had to give up. To abide meant that I had to accept grace. To abide meant I had to trust in God. I understood obedience, but I didn't understand grace. And this is the struggle we often find ourselves in. And I want to read to you that John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. It'll be on the screen. It, and, and then I think you'll start to understand in, in a couple minutes why I was struggling so much with that word abide. This is what it says in John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches, excuse me, are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now the word abide was used nine times in those 11 verses. God is the vine, we are the branches, and we get our nourishment from him. If we remain or abide in him, because some translations will say remain in me, we are letting him grow fruit in us. He is making us a healthy branch. If we do not abide, we are limiting our ability for nourishment. See, when I was struggling with the idea of abiding, I was making my life in Christ harder on myself than I needed to. I needed to accept grace and flourish in return. But I was too worried about being the perfect branch. I was actually not letting God prune me, I was pruning myself. I share all this because last week I spoke very passionately about cheap grace or the wantonness attitude that had crept into the early church that Jude felt very passionately that he needed to address. The attitude is nonchalant about sin. The attitude does not lead to righteousness, but to death. This attitude says sin doesn't matter because God will forgive. I spoke passionately about that topic, but I need to quickly establish the dangers of swinging the pendulum too far the other way. When we forget how to abide, when we forget how to accept and hold tightly to grace and believe that we are one sin away from banishment, 
That's just as dangerous. If you want to understand what it means to abide in the vine of Jesus, the ability to abide is found in the middle of the struggle between grace and obedience. It's found in the middle. It goes like this, grace, obedience, abide. Jude spends much of his short letter addressing the idea of perverting the grace of God into sensuality. He uses the examples of Egypt's unwillingness to believe in God of Israel, the angels seeking more authority, and Sodom and Gomorrah and their indulgent sexual perversion. He's making the argument that these examples showcase a false understanding of who God is and what he wants from his church. And he's going to go on and continue to rail against that for a few minutes here. We're going to read verses 8 through 16 in just a second here, and Jude is going to break down uh, exactly what it looks like to have this cheap grace. But when we started today, I wanted you to understand this is not a pendulum swing thing. We're not jumping over here to this perfect obedience that the, that the Pharisees were trying to put on the people of Israel. We're going to abide in Christ. But while we work through that, we're going to read Jude 8 through 16, and he's going to continue to make his case. After he makes his case, we'll move on. We're going to, we're going to break it down a little bit. But Jude 8 through 16 says this, Yet in like manner these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh. They reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment. He said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perish in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up their foam for their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken about against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Now there's a lot in those eight verses. Uh, there's a lot. And I'm going to go into detail about some of it. I can't spend time to go into detail about all of it. Jude is still making his case. And we need to understand going into this section that this is a continuation of what we talked about last week. He is driving his point home before he makes a plea to the church for what to do. So let's break it down just a little bit. Verse 10 is interesting. It says this, but these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. I think we understand what is right and what is wrong. The question is whether we will accept what is wrong is wrong. Jude is saying that because there are people that are perverting the grace of God into sensuality and they're making God's standards illegitimate. And they're doing this by blaspheming all that they do understand. And the problem is they don't understand God's standard. They don't want to understand God's standard. And all the while they're destroying themselves by partaking in what they know is wrong but here's the problem. They don't want it to be wrong. They don't like God's standard. They don't want to submit to him. After that, Jude gives three quick examples in one verse. Quick examples that, that 
Israel would have understood. He calls out the actions of Cain and Balaam and Korah as examples of these Christians, uh, examples to these Christians of, of people that they would understand. They would know these stories. And so we're going to break those down real quick. We all know the story of Cain. Cain offered a sacrifice to God, but it was half hearted. He didn't really want to worship God in that moment. He was doing it almost out of obligation. He didn't really give it his all. And then when his lack of care and respect towards God was contrasted with his brother Abel and his accepted sacrifice, Cain blamed not himself but Abel and killed Abel. Cain was flippant and half-hearted in his approach to serving God. And Jude points out that that same idea is prevalent in the church. They didn't want to really, truly worship God. Next, he mentions Balaam. Now, Balaam, Balaam's kind of a weird story. Because Balaam, if you just read Numbers chapters 22 through 24, you would get the idea that Balaam's not that bad of a guy. He, he, was, he was willing to do what God asked him to do. He was not willing to curse. See, what had happened is Balak, and they have weird names, I don't get it, but Balak had come to Balaam because he knew that Balaam had the ability to speak to God, and he wanted Balaam to speak to God and ask for the ability to curse Israel. He wanted to curse Israel because Israel was on the cusp of taking over the the land that Balak owned. And Balak was afraid of him, so he knew if he could get Balaam to curse Israel that they wouldn't be able to advance because Balaam had had abilities with divination and ability to, to curse people, and it had worked. And so if you read through this, what happens is Balaam says, I can't speak anything that God doesn't let me speak. And so you'd read through this and you'd think, oh, Balaam's a good guy. He won't speak a curse from God when God only has a blessing for Israel. But if you further study the character of Balaam, he wasn't as good of a guy as you would have believed, as he would want you to believe. Balaam was blessed with the ability to understand God and hear his voice. But he also chose to practice divination. He was flirting with the spiritual realm and enjoying making the profit off of this divination. And furthermore, he wanted to curse Israel. He wasn't part of Israel. He had a unique ability to, to know the voice of God even though he wasn't Israel. And he continued to go to God three times asking for the ability to curse Israel. And each time God said, no, I have a blessing for Israel. So he says, I'm sorry, I can't do what you want me to do. I can only speak with God. And it makes him look great, but he's not. He wanted the financial gain that Balak had to offer by cursing Israel. Balaam also, now catch this, you have to read quickly in in chapter 31 to catch what happens here. It's one quick line. But Balaam also advises the people of Israel into idol worship and lewd sexuality with the people, with the women of Moab. He didn't acknowledge God, uh, God's godliness, even though he himself had been blessed with a unique connection to God, being able to hear and speak his, from his voice. Balaam could have been a great man of God, but he chose financial gain and the ways of the world instead and other gods. Contrast that with the other prophets that we read about, prophets like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so on. They did the will of God and spoke the word of God even in dire situations, even when it wasn't good for them. Balaam shows us that even those who have authority can lead people astray when they're not committed to the truth of God. This makes it critical to teach truth and not lead others into sinfulness. I believe that there are many pastors out there today who in an effort to grow in popularity and influence and gain financially at the same time have withheld truth from their congregations and online followers. Teachers of the prosperity gospel are first in line in the race to be like Balaam. Truth must prevail. Korah is the next example. 
Korah, his story is kind of simple, and it's sad. See, he raises up a group of people to challenge the authority of Moses, and more so, God's a choice of Moses as the leader of Israel. He wants to be the leader of Israel. He wants the authority. And Korah was more interested in that authority and that influence than serving the God that had brought them out of Egypt. And God destroyed Korah and his whole family. Now, are we half-hearted as we seek God Are we rejecting the truth of God? Are we challenging his authority over our life? If so, we are walking in the ways of Cain and Balaam and Korah. And therefore, we are exactly what Jude is preaching against in this letter. If that's us, then Jude says we are swept away by winds. We are twice dead. We are uprooted. In other words, we have no foundation. We aren't connected to the vine, and we won't produce fruit. Jude wraps up this section with a very pointed ending. And it's, it's best just to read it again because it's so good. I can't really add much to it. Jude 14 through 16. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly for their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. I really can't add to that. Jude has made his point and he made it well. And we have to, we've harped on that for two Sundays now. So now it's time to figure out, as we continue on in this book, what does Jude suggest instead? Because we know that that's not the way. Cheap grace and perverting the grace of God is not the way. But Jude has a suggestion for us. He has a few suggestions for us. So Jude 17 through 21 says this. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, hold on, let's stop there. But you, who's he talking to again? We have to remind ourselves what we talked about last week. This is to those who are called, those who are beloved in in Christ Jesus and those who are kept for Jesus. This is to you, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. I love how Jude makes a very quick shift here. For 16 verses, Jude has hammered this idea of false teaching. He didn't hold back. And as soon as verse 17 starts, there's a direct shift. And it starts with two words, but you. We're different. We're called to be different from that. We must remember that we are beloved. The case has been built against the false teachings, but you are to be different. But you, beloved, are called to something greater. Let's look at what we're called to. First, he tells us to remember the predictions of the apostles. We were told this would happen. We were told this would happen again. This isn't brand new news to us. Acts 20, 28 through 32, Paul is speaking to the church at Ephesus about the dangers that is lurking in false teaching. He says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things 
to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. That's Acts 20, 28 through 32. So we need to be ready. We need to be ready. That's step one, is to remember the prediction of the apostles and be ready. We should be learning the word of God and submitting to it, and we should also be checking who we let influence us. There are many who sound impressive because of good speaking ability. It doesn't mean their theology is good. Just because they speak well doesn't mean that what they're saying is truth. Nobody's perfect. I'm a prime example of that. I'm surely not perfect. I'm seeking to say things in the correct interpretation of Scripture, but by no means am I an authority on this. But there are some very, very popular speakers online and in big churches that have some very dangerous theologies, and their people are getting sucked into it because of their passion or because of their ability to speak. And I want us to be careful who we let influence us. Balaam sounded like a great man of God, didn't he? But he wasn't. I will also say, just because someone is popular online doesn't make them a sound biblical scholar. I've seen some very dangerous online preaching who have hundreds of thousands convinced that God isn't worried about their sin. I'm not sure these preachers have spent much time in the book of Jude. And I'm just going to do something that feels a little uncomfortable right now. Joel Osteen is a false teacher. And you should not be following his theology because he won't call sin, sin. He is leading people astray with the idea of the better life. You know? God wants you to have a good life. That's what he says. God wants you to admit that you're a sinner and accept his grace. There's others, I won't name them, but there's others that uh, are toeing that line too. And just because they're popular online or they write a book doesn't make them a solid teacher. Next, Jude tells us to build yourselves up in the most holy faith. That's what we're called to, to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. At the beginning of the letter, Jude implored us as the readers, to contend for the faith. That was last week's push at the end, was to contend for the faith. That's where we left off. Now, towards the end of the letter, Jude is telling us to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. Building faith takes time. It's not something that we just decide to have more faith. You have to build it, and it takes time. It takes energy. It takes life experiences, both good and bad. Building faith starts with a foundation, is Christ your foundation? Are you building your faith in a way that will succeed when the storms of life come? That foundation has to be in Christ. It has to be. As you continue to build upon that foundation, I think it's appropriate to look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's one of my favorites. I'll probably read it often. But it says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and accepting to God, which is a spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When God meets us where we are as sinners, he promises us to forgive our sins, but he doesn't want to leave it there. He wants to transform us. He has ideas for how to live this life correctly. Sadly, I know many people who have been baptized into forgiveness, but who have and are missing out on letting God transform them. Why are we afraid to let God call the shots? Why are we afraid to let God change us? Remember the list from last week of what God wants to build in us through his Holy Spirit? More love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't you want that? I want that. 
Don't you want to let God change how you think, how you process? As you do, you'll recognize just how ugly sin is. That's, that's what's amazing to me, is as he builds that fruit into your, into your life and you begin to become so much more fruitful, it'll also show you how ugly sin is and it just won't be as attractive to you. God wants to renew you. He wants to transform you from a selfish sinner into a forgiving servant and a forgiven servant. To do that, you will need to learn to abide and to let him transform you. It's all about submitting to him in reverence to his goodness, in reverence to his power and his might, to build yourself up in the holy faith. Next, Jude challenges us to pray in the Spirit. And I want you to understand that when Jude says to pray in the Spirit, he's not making a case for uh, speaking in tongues. That's not what he's doing here. That would be the wrong interpretation of this. And, and, and I know this because Jude is telling all of us to pray in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Spirit. And we know that speaking in tongues is a gift from the Holy Spirit that Paul is very clear that not everybody gets. So we can't have it both. Jude can't be telling us to pray in the Holy Spirit and we know that speaking in tongues is only a gift of the Spirit that not everybody gets. This is him telling us to do it. Paul also calls us to pray in the Spirit as part of putting on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. It says this, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is encouraging everyone to put on the armor of God and never stop praying in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit takes perseverance. For supplication, praying for supplication for God's provision and praying for him that he may be bold. And may I ask you to pray for me that I would be bold. While you pray in the Spirit, pray, please pray also that I would be encouraged to be faithful in my preaching the good news. When we let the Spirit lead our prayers, we will begin to pray for others just as much as we pray for ourselves. In fact, more. Prayer is very important. Jesus would often go off into the wilderness to pray. He wanted to be close to his Father. He wanted that closeness. And I will tell you that praying on the top of mountains is pretty special. I understand why Jesus often went off by himself. Are you letting God transform your prayer life? I know that it can be tricky to figure out, but try to find a place or a time that you can truly just pray. Prayer shouldn't be intimidating. It really shouldn't. When we submit ourselves to God and we let the Spirit lead, prayer becomes easier and easier. It becomes a conversation that continues throughout the day. It becomes less about, dear Lord, ask for something, amen, and a lot more of a conversation with the Spirit of God. And a prayer life takes practice, too. Get out of your comfort zone and let prayer and communion with God be part of your daily life. I'm, I'm consistently amazed at how many people don't spend time in the Word of God and don't spend time in prayer and then wonder why God isn't transforming them or wonder why, what God wants from their lives. They don't know. Well, the first thing is that he wants a relationship with you. He really does. So talk to him. Let him talk to you through his word. Praying in the spirit lets God lead your prayers, and that's the important thing. I know I have to give that up a lot of times because I want to pray for what I want to pray for, but I have to let the spirit lead my prayers. And it will take some time and practice, but Romans chapter 8, verse 5 tells us, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. If our mind is of worldly and fleshly things, it'll be hard to pray in the Spirit. But once we set our mind on the will of God, the Spirit will move within us. He will once again transform us, this time through the way that we pray. 
One last thing that Jude challenges us to in this section is to keep in the love of God. That's the last thing, is to keep in the love of God. And I love the analogy that is used in Scripture so many times of the shepherd and the sheep, God being the shepherd and us being the sheep. This analogy is so perfect for who we are and who God is. We wander away and God protects us. We aren't very smart and God leads us. We need help with everything and God is the sacrificial shepherd who looks out for the best of us. The thing is that the sheep that stay closest to the shepherd, they do the best. They recognize that he's protector, he's provider, he's the source of good. The sheep that consistently wander into whatever it is that brainless sheep wander into make life more difficult for themselves. As we keep ourselves in the love of God, I think it's important to keep ourselves close to God. He is willing and, and desiring to love us, but for some reason we continually try to do life without him. We continue mindlessly walking towards that which would kill us. Keeping yourselves in the love of God has nothing to do with how perfectly you obey. It's how well you abide. Are you abiding in the vine? Are you drawing your nourishment from God's deep-rooted vine? Are you allowing God to prune you when necessary? And pruning is important to be a flourishing branch. Are you connected in the spirit of prayer? Are you building your most holy faith? There are things, there are, uh, there are, these are ways of keeping yourself in the love of God. And as I close also, just let me say, give yourself grace that God gave you. We can swing the pendulum in ways that God never meant for us to do. Walk in grace and obedience. Not just grace and not just obedience. Walk in both. In other words, abide. We're all waiting for God's mercy that leads to eternal life. We are all in this together. And next week, we're gonna finish out this letter by looking forward. We've seen how the dangerous this sinful desire can be, and we have all more than likely seen that just in our own personal behaviors. We know that living for the flesh will lead to nothing but death. Now we're going to try to walk in faith, contend for the faith, build ourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, keeping in love of God, and waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And all of that is so much easier when we do it together. Don't forget, Jude is challenging the church with this letter. He wants them to seek truth and godliness, not false doctrines and perverted grace. Jude is challenging the church. In other words, he's challenging us. And the church is a group of people, not a specific person. He isn't writing this to you to do it all by yourself. He's writing it to us to do this together. We're stronger together. We are his church. And together, we will build up our most holy faith. We will pray in the spirit and keep in the love of God and wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life.